day one of our time for change has arrived. He was once known as the Sheriff of Wall Street. We are fighting for the very soul of government. Before landing in New York's top job. If you could go back in time and do it all over again, what would you do differently? Tonight, the former Attorney General turned Governor of New York. So help me God. Elliot Spitzer. What life lessons have you learned since stepping down as Governor? Goes one-on-one -on -one with News 12, answering questions about the new political landscape in Albany. In, in some areas, I think there will be unintended consequences. The Me Too movement. We needed to go through this movement. And much. What do you think your legacy will be? Much more. Could you ever see a scenario where you would run for elected office again? A special edition of Power and Politics starts now. Hello everyone, I'm Tara Rosenblum. The political rise and fall of Elliot Spitzer is a story most of you are pretty familiar with. But today, you're going to learn things about our former governor you likely have never heard before. He recently agreed to a rare sit-down interview where he was game for any question on any topic and got extremely personal. I want to start out just by pointing out the obvious. You are obviously not a stranger to a lot of our viewers in New York. I'm curious, when you're out and about walking on the street, what do people come up to you and have to say? Most of the time they say, hey, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, wish you were still in government. Um, unless they're Wall Street bankers, in which case <laughs> they may not react that way. Uh, but uh, people are wonderful. They're affable, love to talk politics, talk about you know, the soccer team uh, that just won the national world title and, you know, whatever it is, the, the issue of the moment. You were known for a very long time as the sheriff of Wall Street. Is Wall Street in better shape today to prevent another crisis? Well, Wall Street is in, in, in better shape not because the structural reforms that were necessary were put in place. Now, I would have done more to put in place a real Volcker, what we now call the Volcker Rule, which was something approaching a restoration of Glass-Steagall, which was the separation of commercial and investment banking, because it was the convergence of those two and the sort of loss of restraint within the financial system that resulted from that and some other factors as well that led to the conflagration. So, but we're still in, in better shape because you necessarily learn from the last crisis. Some of the um, enormous risk taken uh, that the banks undertook has dissipated. Uh, equity has been pushed into the banks, so the capital levels are higher than they were. The problems have moved to the non-bank sector. Some of the hedge funds, there's tremendous liquidity out there in non-bank entities that are not governed by the rules that were put in place for the banks. So there's still a lot of danger and risk out there, but there should be risk. That's what makes capitalism work. Do I see signs of something around the corner? No. Uh, the, the economy is actually in pretty good shape. Always exogenous shocks that, that could cause trouble. If the trade war continues for much longer, it will get difficult for some sectors. But, you know, the banking sector is in better shape, but it is always possible something can happen. So you're not predicting a recession anytime soon? No, I think the economy is actually in pretty, you know, as long, and, and, and rates are so low that and unemployment is low, growth is, is, has inched up a little bit, the economy is in decent shape. The reins of state government for the first time in recent memory solely in the hands of Democrats. How do you feel that Albany has changed the most during its first year of one party rule? Well, uh, the, 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 you, you've hit on the critical issue. This is the first time in a while that there has been democratic control of both the legislature and the governor's office. It was what I aspired to in, when I won in 06, but now that you've had it, a progressive agenda has been effectuated in, in many ways very effectively and very well. Um, in, in some areas, I think there will be unintended consequences from legislation that was pushed a bit rapidly in a moment of uh, energy, but uh, perhaps excess energy. And so there's going to be have, have to be some thinking. But for the first time in state history, the process was completed without three men in a room. Andrea Stewart Cousins, the first woman ever to lead a conference here in New York. How did having a female in the room impact the process, in your opinion? I think she's brought reason and judgment. And I think she and, uh, and the speaker, Carl Hasty have actually seized control of state government. In, in a way, the governor was pushed aside and they said, we will now legislate. And he basically said, okay, send me bills, and they did, and he signed them. What do you think was their biggest accomplishment? 
demonstrating that Albany could, in fact, govern if you had one party that could work internally and negotiate internally and acknowledge that we have an agenda. We have said to the public, we will pass it. We will do so. Here it is. No matter which side of the aisle you sit on, it's hard to argue that this year's session wasn't productive. Lawmakers passed 935 bills in six months, which was 300 more than last year, many of them attention-grabbing. But which one surprised you the most? The one that was perhaps most personal to me, and I was gratified to see it pass, had to do driver's licenses, which is still an intensely controversial issue. Um, I think the legislature did the right thing. It's obviously an issue I had raised back in 07, and it has been a bumpy path for the issue. I give credit to the advocates who pushed over the past decade to keep the issue on the agenda. You know, this year's session resulting, as you said, some of the most progressive left-leaning policies in the country, clearly resulting in criticism from the Republicans, but even the state Democratic chairman openly admitted that he's worried about this potentially um, creating a backlash in the suburbs in Long Island and Westchester County. Did the Democrats go too far or was the tone just right? Well, it, it, nothing's ever just right. I mean, you, you and I know that. There are always subtleties. I, I would say this. I think that the issue is one of balancing uh, genuine, and, and uh, I spoke to this issue for many years when I was in government, desire for greater equity and fairness in our economic system versus the need to create an environment that still generates investment and the jobs that will create the wealth that drives New York State. I would use as an example where things went unfortunately wrong, uh, the failure to get the Amazon deal through. But let me tell you, 25,000 jobs Average salary, 150000 and what I thought was a terribly misguided effort by AOC and Mike Gennaris to kill that deal. Hugely disturbing to me that they didn't understand the economic importance of those jobs, the upside to those jobs, and I think that speaks to a mindset that, that I deeply disagree with, and uh, that, that troubled me a great deal. Well, that is something that you have in common with the governor. He's fuming over that. But speaking of the governor, it's no secret that you've had an adversarial relationship in the past. What is that relationship like today? Well, uh, we're, we're in different uh, sectors, and uh, until he becomes a real estate investor, I get back in politics, which isn't going to happen. Uh, we'll probably just coexist in, in different worlds. How is Andrew Cuomo doing as governor? Give him a report card, if you will. Look, I don't, I don't like to jo judge other people. I, I would say this, that keep in mind, as I said, or, said many times, he worked very hard to keep the Republicans in control of the Senate. And so to the extent that there has now been a progressive agenda implemented, it is because the Democrats won the Senate, which is something I tried to do. Do you think stricter ethical measures are needed in Albany right now? We need more transparency. We need more media uh, inquisitiveness up in Albany. And we need just uh, greater honesty. New York is now a state where the Democrats outnumber the Republicans three to one, which is an even larger advantage than when you yourself were governor. What does a Republican need to do in the state of New York to win statewide office? I think it's very hard for Republicans to exist in New York State unless they run away from the National Party. And, and they haven't done that yet. How frustrating is it for you to be analyzing all these issues with me instead of legislating them? Well, you know, look, I loved my years in government. I wish they had continued for a number of years beyond where they did. Uh, but life is a series of chapters. And yes, it's, it's, uh, do I look back longingly in some way? Of course. But do I derive great joy from what I'm doing now? Absolutely. And so there it is. Which elected official in the state of New York do you admire the most? You know, I might go with Chuck. Chuck he, Schumer. Yeah, whom I've known for many years. Mm -hmm. He is a street fighter but also sees the larger playing field. He is now risen, as we all know, to the Democratic leadership of, of the, hopefully he'll be majority leader in the Senate, although that may or may not transpire in the next national elections. Um, smart, thoughtful, modulated, careful, knows how to get things done. What is your personal thoughts about the Me Too movement? I, I think it is uh, a necessary and critical examination of, an, of environmental issues in terms of sexual harassment and other related issues that we needed to go through this movement as a society to focus on the right remedies and create 
the, a workforce and a workplace environment that was proper at every level. You have reinvented yourself many times over in your lifetime, lawyer, attorney general, prosecutor, governor, um, real estate tycoon, father. Which job do you feel out of all those things you excelled the most at? As any parent, I, I would hope would say the same thing, proudest of my kids. And, and that is, at the end of the day, hands down, the most important thing any of us can do. Up next, Elliot Spitzer talks 2020 before taking some extremely personal questions about his highly publicized past. How difficult was it for you to make the decision to step down? That question and many, many more when the special Power in Politics episode returns after a quick break. Welcome back to this special edition of Power and Politics. I'm Tara Rosenblum. We continue our exclusive sit-down interview with New York's former governor, Elliot Spitzer, and get his take on presidential politics. Let's talk about the president. You are both the New Yorkers. You're both real estate tycoons. You both have had a life in the public eye and have pursued public service. You have both have been on multiple TV shows. Is that where the similarities end? I hope so. He basically has an Orwellian relationship with facts. He, he doesn't understand, as we've seen, that there is objective reality and then there's fantasy land. He, the two are conflated for him and it is problematic at many, many levels. And frankly, if he'd stayed in the real estate world, it would have been okay, let him play his games. But now in the public domain, there are serious consequences and we are seeing them play out. His constant attacks on the judicial system, on Congress, on the Supreme Court even, on the Fed every day, his lack of presidential demeanor are, are doing grave damage to our notion of democratic governance. Is there anything that you would give the president good marks for? Yes. And it was interesting, in, in the first democratic debate, when the question was posed to the candidates, I forget which evening it was, what is the greatest strategic threat to the United States? And I think eight of the ten said China. And I think on that issue, trade with China, he's been right. Which person in the crowded field of Democratic candidates has the best shot at unseating Donald Trump? Well, you know, I, I've not endorsed anybody. Nobody's asked me for my endorsement. But if I had to put together a ticket right now, I think a Biden-Harris ticket or brings the coalition together. From there, we segue to Albany and got his take on some of the most hot button topics of the year. In a major victory for environmentalists, lawmakers approved one of the most aggressive climate change bills in the nation, calling for 100% carbon free electricity in New York by 2040. Is this doable and is this a new benchmark for the entire country? Well, it, it, it's aspirational. It doesn't mean anything yet because until somebody explains how we're getting there and until we start actually building either the solar or the wind generating capacity or bring in natural gas, which isn't perfect, but is better than coal. Sweeping sexual harassment legislation got passed, making it easier for employees to come forward with sexual harassment allegations. Are there any downsides to this new plan? Look, I'm sure somebody can come up with some downside to it somewhere, but this, this was the right bill to pass. It is obviously an issue of the moment. It is getting the attention it deserves. It is um, in the papers every day in every possible uh, manner. Um, so is the right bill to pass. One of the big attention grabbers this year, lawmakers voted to end the state religious waivers for vaccinations for schools in the wake of the measles outbreak. Was that a good move or not? It was, it was controversial. It, it, it was a good move. When it comes to public health like this and vaccinations where one child's refusal to get a vaccination can have enormous consequences for everybody else, this is an area where the state was right to say Everybody should be vaccinated. A big push to legalize marijuana this year. That didn't happen. Instead, marijuana possession was decriminalized. What do you suspect ultimately killed that plan behind closed doors? That, I just don't know. Just don't know. I will say this. I think moving thoughtfully and perhaps carefully and slowly on this is the right thing to do. 
And then our conversation took a more personal turn. The former governor answered questions about the prostitution scandal that forced him out of office and much more, including his current role of real estate tycoon. As a young man, you had a big job at a Manhattan law firm. Your father had a major real estate company. Why did you decide to pursue a life in public service to begin with? It's, it's rewarding. It is exciting. It is, the issues are tough, um, challenging. You get to deal with fascinating people and do something that you hope moves society in the right direction. Well, what better job can you get than that? Well, you were inaugurated our 54th governor January 1st, 2007. I was there. What are you most proud of during that year and a half that you served? It was saying government has an affirmative role to play, not so that it pushes out private sector growth. I mean, I'm a firm capitalist, in which uh, I wish more Democrats would just come out and say that, but seeing government play the role that it can and should play. How difficult, I was also there on March 17, 2008, how difficult was it for you to make the decision to step down? It was very hard. I mean, I don't want to relive that, but it was very difficult. How did you ultimately decide to resign as opposed to apologize? Well. I did both, but it was my family that came first at that moment. Do you think that you were treated fairly from the media and the public during that whole ordeal? The First Amendment is a critical guardian of our democracy, and so even though you may wince at various times and disagree, I've tried very hard never to criticize or certainly not to blame the media for problems that uh, were of my own generation. If you could go back in time and do it all over again, what would you do differently? I would, in terms of governance, I think I would have dealt with the legislative leaders a little differently. Um, tried on one hand to be slightly more accommodating on some of the things they were looking for. What life lessons have you learned since stepping down as governor? Without delving into it and uh, too much, I'd say we all can be replaced. After stepping down, you took a five-year hiatus and then you decided to make a run for city controller. Did that loss sting or were you expecting well, it? Well, losing is never fun. <laughs> it's always better to win than to lose. Look, I got 48% of the vote against uh, uh, the, the, the torrential onslaught of adverse uh, stuff that was going on. Um, I enjoyed the race, don't regret doing it. Could you ever see a scenario where you would run for elected office again? Inconceivable. Just not going to do it. That's strong language. That's strong language. Absolutely not going to happen. Um, I'm 60, love what I'm doing. Earlier this year, you saw the completion of your first ground up development project with the real estate development firm founded by your late father, 420 Kent in Brooklyn. What was the significance of that accomplishment for you? It, it, it's, it's wonderful. It's really, there's a sense of accomplishment. Put the finances aside, a sense of joy that something is being created. So as a developer, um, you've probably come into contact with uh, closely with a lot of the bankers you once went after. Has that been a difficult dynamic to manage? Well, there's some banks that won't do business with us, um, AIG, that even though leadership there has changed, obviously, um, they were looking at a mortgage, uh, some debt financing on a project, and when they realized who the ownership was of, of the building, they said, ah, we don't want to do it, which is, you know, that's okay. They're, they're, uh, from their perspective, there are a lot of developers to lend to. From my perspective, there are a lot of banks to borrow from. Up next, Elliot Spitzer speaks about his children and legacy. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Power and Politics. Now the conclusion of our rare sit-down interview with Elliot Spitzer. What do you think your legacy will be? Depends who you ask. You know, when, to come full circle, when I walk down the street, the people come up to me and eight out of 10 want to chat and say thank you for standing up for them. They remember what I did as Attorney General, standing up, whether it was to Wall Street, on the environment, civil rights. Surprisingly, in New York City, cab drivers love me. And this goes back to the issue of driver's licenses and representing those at the bottom 
of our economic structure. And if that's, uh, that's what I'm proud of, and if that's the legacy, that, that's, that's great with me. I remember when I was starting out covering politics in New York, all that I ever heard was the buzz that you could one day be the first Jewish president of the United States. Do you ever lament over what could have been? You know, I don't think I'd have any credibility if I said, no, I never think about that. Um, so I think the best answer is I try to keep it to 30 seconds a day because beyond that it's kind of useless and uh, it kind of distracts from leading a happy life otherwise. Are you leading a happy life otherwise oh, yeah. right now? It's great. And as I said, at dinner with three amazing kids last night uh, who were in their 20s, um, one married, one engaged, and I probably shouldn't say this one, probably will be soon. Mm -hmm. um, no pressure. Uh, but it couldn't be better. No, no pressure at all. We've got much more on our interview with the former governor of New York online and in my Turn to Tara podcast, just head to news12.com. I'm Tara Rosenblum, and thanks for tuning in for this special edition of Power and Politics. <laughs>